All right, guys, if you'll take out your Bibles and turn to a couple places, actually, this morning. Uh, turn to the book of Joshua and hold your place there and also turn to the book of Philippians. If you don't have a Bible, there's Bibles in the back of the seats. And if you don't want to grab one of those, that's okay, we won't judge you. And we will guide you along in this process. So um, you may be wondering why we're in the book of Joshua and the book of Philippians. Well, um, as we come up on a new year, we want to look at some things regarding life and maturity and progression and using our time wisely. Um, last year we, we had a message, a uh, New Year's message, and I said, last year, I said, this time next year, what's going to be different about your life? This next year, what direction will your life take? What advancements will it make? And, and now we're actually sitting at that time where we, we can reflect back and see. We know for sure there's a lot of variables in life, but those variables really end up being constants. We, we know there's going to be death and life. We know there's going to be success and failure. We know there's going to be heartache and heartbra heartbreak. We know there's going to be um, great joy. We know there's going to be world catastrophe, disasters. We know people are going to get sick and people are going to get better. We know there's going to be all these different things. We're going to experience all those things. The important thing is how we go through those things and what they do to us to draw us closer to Jesus Christ. And so now as we sit here on the cusp of another year, then I'd like to challenge you again and say when we meet again this time next year, what will be different about our life? A.W. Tozer, quoting from Socrates, actually said, a life not inspected is not, uh, not a life worthy to be lived. It's important that sometimes we take an opportunity to sort of reflect on our life, look at what's going on, see where we're going, see how things are developing. And now it's a time we can kind of look back on that year and say, hey, how has my relationship with Jesus Christ really grown and developed? Ultimately, that's the goal, isn't it? We'll look at that in a second. Just to give you some ammunition to be thinking about where your life is headed and things that are going on in your life, because sometimes it's hard to be objective about our own life, isn't it? Uh, A.W. Tozer, again, he, ha he has these rules for self-discovery. There's seven of them, and, and they, they'll be a good barometer to where your life is. Trage trajectory is headed. Number one, what do we want the most? Number two, what do we think about the most? Number three, how do we use our money? We can also say our resources. Number four, what do we do with our leisure time? Number five, the company we enjoy. Number six, who and what we admire. And number seven, what we laugh at. So I think those are good general rules to kind of give us an idea of where we are, where we're going, what's important to us. In Matthew 6.33, it says, to Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, all the extraneous extra things of life will be added unto you. Amen. Look at, if your finger's in Philippians, Philippians is actually chapter 3. So when we start to think about life, we start to think about what's going on. We want to move from a place of where we're just existing, where we're just trying to make it through the day to 
the place where the Bible talks about we're more than conquerors, that we're victorious, that we're overcoming. And that's not always linear. Sometimes we, we sabotage our thinking in a message like this, thinking that, okay, tomorrow I'm going to live by faith and my life like a rocket's just going to go straight up into the heavenlies. And we find out that it, it, it's really not linear like we think, but it's, it's more a consistency going through the variables of life is what's really important. Ultimately, then, it's, it's our target. It's what's important to us. It's what we're after. It's where we're aiming. So Paul in Philippians 3, 12, he, he put it like this. this. This is the way he saw it. He said, not that I've already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. So do you see what was, what was important? That was his goal, to move toward all that God had for him. And then notice in verse 13, he says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, saying I'm not there yet, that God has a lot more for me. But one thing I do, I'm forgetting those things which are behind, and I'm reaching, agonizing, straining, stretching forward to the things which are ahead. And I think that's a good message for us today, that we would strain, stretch forward to the things ahead. Verse 14, he said, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in God, of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, let us have this mind, mindset, mind. And if any of you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. The whole, whole point is, I want to give my all pressing in the direction of Christ. And so if you turn to the book of Joshua chapter 1, this chapter illustrates what Paul just said. In Joshua chapter 1, it speaks about moving forward. The title of the message this morning is 2015, A Time to Move Forward. 2015, a time to move forward. You'll notice in Joshua chapter 1 then, we come to a place in, in the scriptures where the children of Israel are, are now embarking on what God has called them to do, yet it was a delayed reaction or delayed response. In other words, they should have been where they were going 40 years earlier. You may remember the story. The children of Israel were led out of slavery in Egypt through their deliverer, who God raised up according to their prayers, who was who? Moses. Moses. So through divine workings of Moses, through the plagues, through the Red Sea, God takes them on out into first the wilderness, and then on the border of the promised land, two spies go in. I'm sorry, 10 spies go in. 12 spies go in. <laughs> 12 spies go in. They come back. 10 are saying, hey, let's not do it. It's scary. There's enemies there. There's big guys. We look like grasshoppers compared to them. Forget about it. The two guys, the two spies who were... Joshua and Caleb, they said, hey, they're scary guys. There, there are big things, big challenges, but let's go for it because God said we can do it. There you see the, the attitude of moving forward, the boldness of somebody who says, if God said it, we can do it. Of course, then the children of Israel did not go into the promised land. Instead, they did not act, instead of acting by faith, they they acted in unbelief and they remained in the, in the wilderness for 40 years 
until they all died out, except for the two. So now we get to the place where, okay, now's a reset. Now's another opportunity. Now are they going to act in faith? There's still scary people. There's still obstacles. There's things to overcome, but now another opportunity. So that may be where a reset is for us too. We may need a reset. We may been, have been living this last year for ourselves, or have been selfish or missing the call of God on our life in some way. We may have doubted or been hesitant or stagnant or whatever it is, but today now is the chance for a reset. So notice what he says in verse 1. And the first point I want to point out here is that death is the opportunity for life. Notice what he says in verse 1. So he says, after the death of Moses, interesting, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, the Jordan River, you and all this people to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. So the, the first point is we see that oftentimes in life, it's, it's when things go away, things that we have put our security or our trust in, things that are iconic maybe of our life, things of the past, th things that we've sort of looked at as our frame of reference for how life should look. Imagine the children of Israel now with Moses dying. Moses was their deliverer. Moses was the one in whom God used to to bring forth the plagues on Pharaoh in Egypt, to go through the Red Sea. They saw Moses lift up his staff, and they saw God part the waters. And so their attachment, their association with the working of God was in Moses. And then the giving of the Ten Commandments. And then the, the speaking of God directly to Moses, and Moses speaking to the people, and yet now he was dead. And see, oftentimes in life, it's we get to a point where, where something dies or we, we suffer some sort of loss or something different than we expect, <coughs> something that's not quite in our way of thinking. And those are times when we need to see God in that situation. Because God's never dead. But things in our life may die. Things may change. Things may reposition themselves. Our response to those then, if we worship the one true living God, is that God is not dead. Therefore, with God not being dead, God is living in and through the situation. And, and you notice, it was when Moses died, he said, well, let's go, let's go now. So death or losing something or something repositioning or something different than we think it is, these are God's opportunity to bring forth life. We see that all throughout the Bible. We see that in the life of Job. We see it in the life of Isaiah. In Isaiah 6, where it says, when King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. We see that ultimately in the life of Jesus, don't we? His death brought forth life. And so the first point, the first area of encouragement for you and I this morning is that moving forward this year is to see that God is alive regardless of of the things that we look at that may seem like are dead. And the reason is because God is not dead. And God has a plan. And he's faithful to complete that plan all the way to the end. And so we have that confidence. Well, look at the second point. So in verse 3 now, he says, so when, when you go in, 
Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you. Notice that, past tense. As I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun, that shall be your territory. The second point is, if we're going to move forward in 2015, it's important to claim all your territory. At the height of the reign of the children of Israel, they only, they only secured about a tenth of all their territory that was given to them. That was just explained here. That God had so much more for them. As we read this section of scripture, I, I wonder for myself how much I'm leaving on the table. How much God says, hey, go for it. I've given you this land, this territory, and yet in some way, shape, or form, I've just settled for a comfortable normal. And you know, the older we get, the more difficult it is, at least I have found, to press forward into that open territory of the unknown. We as creatures, as human beings, we have a tendency to like the comfortable normal. And being a Christian a lot of times is not comfortable and it's not normal. Because God is taking us beyond our comfort zone, beyond our normal. Why? Because he wants to do greater things that we could have even imagined in our life. And so the, the children of Israel, sure, they went in now. They went in by faith. They saw God do miracles, right? They saw God defeat the enemies, and that's the thing. That they were in there battling and, and fighting, but they got to a certain point where they were good. Where they just sort of felt like, well, this is, this is just how it is. This, this is now a, a place where I can rest and be comfortable and be satisfied. And God would say, you need to look up and out. Because there is so much more that I have for you. There's so much more on the table, and perhaps it's compromise or settling that, that causes us to stay in a, in a particular location. Ultimately, it's the quenching or grieving of the Holy Spirit that gets in the way of, of God moving in a direction that's bigger than we think. So again, we have to ask ourselves this morning, is my life bigger than I ever thought it would be? And that doesn't mean necessarily you're going to be in a stadium speaking to thousands of people. It just means that is, has God taken root in your life and is he working in your life to do something that draws you into himself? Because in reality, that is the big thing, isn't it? That little old us can come boldly to the throne of grace. That people like us, sinners who are saved by God's grace, can come and stand before a holy God and he bids us to come in. He welcomes us and he wants us to dine with him. That is the miracle. That is the unbelievable message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God says, you can have more of me. You can keep coming forward. I'm available. You, he's basically saying, you can have as much as me as you want. And we find then that that's, that's a wonderful thought and idea. But what causes us to stay at a certain point? What causes us not to go all the way forward. There may be things in our life that we've, we've placed 
in front of our relationship with God. There may be things that we have gone through, some trials, suffering, difficulty that we didn't expect that's caused us to stagnate. And stagnation is not the plan of God for our lives. The plan of God for our life is to be alive, is to experience life, to experience all aspects of our humanity in Christ. And you, you'll notice something. He, he describes the territory, and he, as he describes the territory, he talks about all the different facets of life, the wilderness, that we can experience God in the wilderness if we will appropriate our situation by faith. That the times where the, the great rivers, where God is abounding and pouring out blessings that that by faith we can enjoy those times too. The land of the Hittites, the land of attack and spiritual warfare, that by faith we can enjoy those as well. And of course, the great sea of the going down of the sun, it's, this, it's really ultimately in the times of great trial and difficulty that we experience God the most. So the second point then, if we're going to move forward in 2015, it's important that you and I claim all that God has given us, that we don't fall short through compromise or stagnation or getting into rut, but we keep moving forward by faith, whatever things look like. Look in verse 5. He gives them again this confidence. You see, we need, we need confidence if we're going to move forward. He says, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. The third point about moving forward is the fact that nothing can stop us. That God being with us is all that we need to know to move forward. And, and notice, it seems like through this section of Scripture, Fear was something that they were struggling with. And we know that from the, from the earlier time that they were supposed to go in. And now we see that, that continual encouragement to be strong and courageous. The only way you and I could be strong and courageous to do the things that God asks us to do is to know that it is through Him that we do them. See, if we compare our obstacles to ourselves, we will be subject to great fear. We will be subject to great feelings of insufficiency, inadequacy, hesitancy. We will be in a place where we, like the children of Israel, will say, we can't do this. But the Bible says that through God, all things are possible. So it's, it's never appropriate for the Christian to say, well, I can't do this. It's always appropriate to say, God can do this. Because it is through my weakness that he is strong. And that wherever God leads us, God will enable us. His leading is his enabling. And that's what he wanted the children of Israel to know, didn't he? He wanted them to know that, hey, guys, just watch what I'm going to do. And see, that's, that's why God leads us to places that are beyond ourselves. Because I think he wants to show us how great he is. And it's not until we come to the end of our resources and capabilities that we really find out, wow, he really is great. And that, that same God that led the children of Israel through 
the Red Sea, just like it says in our text, that's the, the same God. He's not different. And you know how sometimes we think, well, he did, you know, he did that back then. That was cool then. But now it's just normal now again. <laughs> now it's up to us now. I think that's wrong. I think that God wants to show and demonstrate his power in us and through us. I think he wants to live through our lives in such a way where, where people will be confounded, where it won't be a human thing, where we just say, wow, look at those people are so gifted and talented and extraordinary. May that never be said. But may it be said that it is by grace that God has done something, that God is doing extraordinary things through ordinary people. And see, that's the thing that really excites me about being a Christian. Because I, I, I wanna see that, don't you? And I, I truly believe that I serve the God of Moses who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he doesn't say, well, you guys are good. You got it all figured out, that technology thing, you guys are so dialed in. <laughs> in that, you don't need to pray anymore because you're so connected to everything. Are we too sophisticated for God? Really? That's what, that's what happens, though. And we start to crowd our life with more and more things, and we forget what the main thing is. Jesus Christ. And could it be that all these things that we crowd our life with are just things that are in reality, they're crowding the power of God working through our life? It could it be that we become reluctant to allow God to work in our life to such an extent where we have to depend on him? And God, in a way, he's saying, just let me and just watch me. Let me do in your generation what I did in Moses' generation. Let me do in your generation what I did in Jesus' generation, in Paul's generation. God's not different. And wouldn't you say the need is desperate now? Amen. People need Jesus. We need Jesus. And we must learn to depend on him. Do you remember the last church in the book of Revelation that is spoken of in the seven churches, the church at Laodicea. Lukewarm church, right? You know what their issue was? They had a lot of stuff. And they said to themselves, we have a lot of stuff, so we don't need God anymore. The rebuke was to buy from God, meaning go to him spiritually and look to spiritual wealth as what's more important. And so there's a desperation to come before God and to surrender ourselves to God and allow the working of God to take us wherever it may. The next point, the fourth point, we find in verse 7. He says again, only be strong and very courageous. So obviously this was an issue. But notice this. This is, this is, this is interesting. He says, be strong and courageous for what reason? For what reason? For the, the reason of going and attacking our enemies? For that reason? For the, the reason of going and showing that it's God and not us? Notice the reason. Be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded. And do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may what? Prosper wherever you go. Now that's, that's interesting. So the fourth point in moving forward is if we're trying to figure out how to move forward, how to follow God, I want to relieve you of much of that burden of wonder and concern and, and just say, if we're following God's word, we're moving forward. But notice, he says, you're, you're going to be strong, need to be strong and courageous. There's going to have to be supernatural empowerment 
to follow God's word because in order to do that, what you do is you, you find that, wow, this, I can't do this on my own. I can't go through life following God's word in obedience without allowing God to work through my life that way, a supernatural empowering, if you will. So what he's saying is that following God, being a doer of his word, it may be scary. Have you found that to be true? It's not practical. Sometimes you don't know what's going on. It'll seem like it doesn't make sense. It won't add up. It's unconventional. And people will tell you even like, well, you can't do this and you can't do that and you, this won't work and that's, that won't work. And yet God says, just follow me and how we do that is following the word. As we follow God in, in his word, the Holy Spirit enables us is that when God works through his word, he works through us, and we then have the word of God, Jesus Christ, working through us as well. You see how it works? So, now here's, here's an important point. Sometimes, sometimes we, we draw a sketch in our minds of what it's supposed to look like. What maybe a Christian looks like. What maybe a Christian life looks like. We may read books or have our favorite pastor or what have you. And then what we do is to say, well, my, my life doesn't look like their life. Is there something wrong? How come something is so different? Or this, this book I read just said it's supposed to be like this. And what I want to encourage us all here today is that if we follow the Lord, we don't have to worry about all these different tracks that God has people on because he just has one track for our life. And following the Lord then is just to be on your track well, to do your thing well. And to be really good about not worrying about other people's tracks. And so when God takes shape in our life, there's a real uniqueness of how Jesus shines through us. A uniqueness that is so unique to us that nobody can emulate that well. And so when we try to emulate somebody else's walk, which is okay if, if we're just emulating the Bible, but when we start to compare and contrast and measure by other people and other ministries and other things, and we get sort of in this uh, branding of Christianity where we brand ourselves with a label that we're this kind of Christian or that kind of Christian or we go to this kind of church or that kind of church. <coughs> Instead, don't worry about all that and just let the Holy Spirit mature and develop Christ in you. Then you'll look like Christ, not a cheap imitation. Be authentic, in other words. Be you, be all you. Enjoy, embrace all that God's doing in your life because you are fearfully and wonderfully, and may I add, uniquely made. So you don't worry about all that stuff. You just thank God for being you and for loving you and working in your life and maturing you and developing you because in the end, it's not about you, it's about Jesus. Jesus. And God wants to bring Jesus out of you, not more of you. He wants to have less of you and more of him. And so that fourth point as we move forward is just knowing if, if you just follow God in simple obedience, 
then you'll be moving forward. The next point we find in verse 8. He says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. That's really important, isn't it? Don't be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So the fifth point is that our success will be proportionate to our interaction with God's word. This is one of the most direct statements in the Bible about the importance and the impact of God's word in our life. Basically, he, he's saying that if we build our life on Jesus Christ, which then in turn leads us to live our life out by and through the word, then he says we'll be successful. Simple as that. A lot of things go through our mind, right? That goes back to what Paul said about what success is. So it's very important that we, ha we define success properly, right? So success, what's biblical success? How do you know if you're, you're being successful? How do I know if I'm being successful? It's, it's, it's very simple. Success for a Christian is being faithful. Amen. Success for a Christian is being faithful to God. Faithful to what he has given us. Faithful to our calling. Faithful to what he has laid out before us. It's as simple as that. Now, as we've seen in our text, being successful and prosperous, air quotes, has a different definition in God's kingdom versus the world's kingdom. Another big pitfall, danger, warning, red flag, is that we use the model of success that the world has to be our model to be a successful Christian. And that is wrong. If Jesus were to be our model for a successful Christian, then we would have to really reevaluate what the world says about success because in worldly terms, Jesus wasn't successful in the way the world would say. Paul was not successful in the way the world would say. These, these were people who materially gave up everything. Jesus became poor so others can be rich. Paul lived a lot of his life in prison. He didn't have much. He didn't leave much behind. So we have to reevaluate what success is. And we see in this text then, what we do as Christians is we get into God's word. He uses these, these terms that it shouldn't depart from, from your mouth. So uh, much of our speaking should be speaking about God, about his word. He says that we should be thinking. You notice that? Day and night, meditating on God's word. And he's telling the children of Israel, if they would do that, they would be, they would be very prosperous and successful in God's eyes. And I think that's very important because we see all throughout the Bible, it was when the word of God was rare that everything went sideways spiritually. We've seen that in all the great revivals in history, that it, it, it centered around a movement to come back to God's word, to implement God's word, to think about it, to talk about it. That's what he's saying here. If God's word, would, imagine if, if we meditated day and night on God's word. Imagine all the junk that goes through our mind, 
all the doubts, all the, all the fears and anxieties. And the Bible says the devil is the accuser of the brethren. So he throws these fiery darts into our brain to get us to think things that are not biblical. And he says, meditate on God, meditate, extract all that God has for you. And through that, then now we're walking with God, drawing closer to God, enjoying God, and enjoying the freedom of God that he's separating us from the world unto himself. The sixth point we find in verse 10. So then he says, Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, pass through the camp and command the people, saying, prepare provisions for yourself, for within three days you will cross over this Jordan to go in and possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. The sixth point in, in moving forward is the importance of preparation. This year, as we mentioned earlier, it's going to have, there's going to be a lot of stuff going on. It's not even the end of the year and we already have another missing plane. We're going to see things that are scary and difficult, but God is also going to present opportunities for us. The key is what we do in the times before the actualization of the blessing, so to speak. So right now, God is preparing us for the next thing, whatever that is. So there, there are practical things that we do, of course, to prepare ourselves for what's next. There are practical things, like we've been talking about, getting into God's word, being obedient to God's word, and making it a practice and a habit of following God in every situation. But the thing is, are, are we ready for what's next? Preparation then ultimately is us being good at being dependent on God. And then equipping ourselves for whatever situation may come forward. And that's simply grounding ourselves in God's word. Amen. Because I think we, we all would understand that sometimes life takes you by surprise, right? Sometimes you get spiritually ambushed. Sometimes you don't see it coming. Sometimes you get sucker punched. But see, when, you, when, you're, when you've made up your mind about who you're going to serve and how you're going to live, then all of that takes care of itself. See, the problem is when we haven't come to that place yet. The problem is when we haven't come to the place where we've decided to follow Jesus, where we're just sort of uh, kind of maybe a little here, a little there, as long as it's convenient, as long as it works for me, as long as it gets me somewhere. But until we come to the place where you say, you know what? For me to live is Christ. Amen. Doesn't matter if I get hit from the back, the side, the front, wherever, whatever may come, may come, your will be done. When we, we, we've come to that place, then we're, we're ready to move forward. Because moving forward, as we see in our next point, moving forward involves a fight. Look at verse 12. So he says, And the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh, Joshua spoke, saying, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God is giving you rest and giving you this land. Your wives, your little ones, your livestock, they shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side, the other side of the Jordan. But you shall pass before your brethren armed, all your mighty men of valor and help them. And notice this word, until. Until the Lord has given your brethren rest. As he gave you, and they also have taken possession of the land which, you're, which the Lord your God is giving them. Notice this word, then you shall return to the land of your possession and enjoy it, which Moses the Lord's servant gave 
gave you on this side of the Jordan towards the sunrise. So what's that talking about? These two and a half tribes said, you know what? Can we not go into the promised land? We, wanted, we found a really nice spot on the other side of the Jordan. Can we just stay there? And it was granted to them. This is a picture of God's allowance of something, but not his perfect will. And so they decided to stay on the other side. But you know what he said? He said, you're not going to stay there and rest. You're going to go in the promised land and help your brethren, help your brothers and sisters fight. And not until there's rest in their land can you go back to your land. The point being is we need to know when it's time to fight and time to rest. And this side of heaven is really not going to be a time of spiritual inactivity if that's what we think rest is. Ironically, biblically speaking, rest is spiritual activity. Our spirit get, doesn't get tired, so when we're, our spirit's active, it's restful. When it's doing something, it's when we're inactive spiritually is when we get tired because it's now the flesh is in operation. So basically what he's saying, if we're going to go forward, we have to understand that going forward is not a path without resistance. Going forward is a path of great resistance. And that's why the encouragement here is continually to be strong and courageous because God is with us to keep moving forward, keep going forward, keep fighting with the weapons of our warfare, which are spiritual and not carnal, and go and take the land for our retirement ultimately is in heaven. And if some way, somehow, we have it in our mind that we can tap out from the battle and find a life of retirement where we don't have to continue to move forward in God's plan and in the, the fighting of the spiritual warfare and the spiritual battle, then that's not correct. Moving forward will involve a fight. The last point we find in verse 16. So their response then, here's what they said. They answered Joshua and they said, All that you command us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we heeded Moses in all things, so we will heed you. Only the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. And whoever rebels against your command does not heed your words. In all that you command them, then they shall be put to death. And again, Only be strong and courageous. The last point then, if we're going to move forward in 2015, is don't be afraid. That was reemphasized over and over in our text. Don't be afraid. Because God is with us. And because of that, like they said, it comes down to this. It comes down to simply saying, Wherever and whenever, God, I am completely yours. This year, 2015, is not about me. It's about you. And to live for all that God has for us in 2015, which is probably going to be a really crazy year, is to just come to the point of saying, Lord, I'm completely yours. And then living and walking that out on an everyday basis. Because in reality, our life is simply a matter of the choices and decisions that we make day in and day out. As we choose for God, we have his promises. As we choose for God each moment, your will be done, God. We know that our life 
will actually mean something. Mean something eternally. That our life here will resonate on forever and ever and ever. And now is our time to do that. And as we look around, we see the signs. God said, this is what it's going to look like before I come back. Guys, we are not in the last days. We are in the last seconds. That we are on the cusp of God birthing something brand new. You can't miss that. One third of the Bible is prophecy telling us what it's going to be like as it was in the days of Noah. So it will be like in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Don't put your head in the sand. There's only one thing to do if you're a Christian to surrender your life fully and completely to Jesus Christ and let Him do whatever He wants with that. Let's pray.